Uh, we are going to um, to hear from Virginia McKinney. Virginia, we're running a little bit late, uh, but not so much. Uh, are you are you there, Virginia? Yes, I yes I am here. Um, I'm a little bit concerned that there may be a, a, a time lag. Um, the video that uh, of the dance was not a video of a dance. It was it was stills at my end. Um, I hope that my video doesn't come across as stills. Was it working as a full video, your end, the dance? Yes, yes we can see you, we can hear you. Uh, wonderful. Oh, the, la the, la the last one. Um, it, it was a video. It, it was, it's just due, it's due to the internet connection, but um, in the gallery it works fine, but just uh, the internet okay. is slow today. Okay, okay. All right. The good, the good thing, uh, Virginia and everybody online who maybe might have problems uh, uh, watching, uh, might have had problems, these, uh, these presentations are recorded and they will be posted um, after the event. So, Virginia, I'm going, I'm going to introduce you uh, briefly. Um, Virginia is an Associate Professor of Painting uh, uh, at Michaelis School of Fine Art, University of Cape Town, South Africa, she, where she is uh, based and she's joining us today from South Africa. Um, Living Languages Land, a British Council Creative Commission's contribu contribution for COP26, proposed a journey through endangered and minority languages, exploring 26 words that reveal different worldviews of land and nature. Um, so, so she was invited to participate and she, uh, in this, and she um, sought collaborative um, to collaborate with First Peoples um, uh, playwright and filmmaker Sylvia Vollenhoven. Um, so um, Virginia is going to um, share with us uh, the making of Saul, but I don't know how to pronounce that, Virginia. So um, Saul. Yes, Saul, Saul. Uh, so it's over to you. Thank you. Um, there we go. Okay, so thank you very much for and thank you very much for inviting me, Marina. Um, can you all hear me? Is that all working fine? Uh, yes, fine. Thank you. Okay, so um, my presentation. I was asked to talk about my practice, and my practice is various. Um, I'm a painter. Um, I'm an academic slash artist, um, and uh, I'm in, concerned with environmental issues. I'm also a curator and a writer. So. I regard my practice as very much uh, an entanglement of all of those things. And I thought it might be useful just to speak about um, a particular project that I've been involved with recently, the making of Chao, um, and uh, take you through some of the things that, that, that built that up and the, in, in the reciprocity of, of exchange, of collaboration, of conversation, and a certain kind of um, the gifting of such a journey. So um, this particular quote, we need to find the Chao of now, to restore our relationship with the land and the divine within is, is, is my collaborator's uh, um, wording, Sylvia Vollenhoven. And um, I'll take you through the journey that we went on together. Okay, this is just a, um, a context setter, if you like. It's a, it's a painting that I finished last year. I will come back to it. So then reciprocity and exchange, cross-pollination, collaboration, communities of support were words that I chose and there, as has been indicated by Marina, Living Languages Land was a British Council Creative Commission, and uh, I was asked to join by Dr. Philippa Bailey. Um, Neville Gaby and her had, had designed the project and were asking, but basically getting hold of artists all across the world. And there, this, was, this is a, um, an image from their website when it was finally put up. They were hoping to gather uh, a lexicon of words from across the, the world of marginalized languages, um, which contain knowledge that is getting lost because the way we express things, the way we articulate ideas, the grammar we use is the kind of thing that will reveal the way we think. And um, Robin Kimmerer was also part of the project and many of you may know Braiding Sweetgrass. Uh, in which one of the key elements that she points out is that uh, uh, English is dominated by nouns and in her own indigenous language there's a, um, a generosity of verbs 
And in that context, the, the world is a far more living and being and doing place rather than a thing place. Mm -hmm. Um, she also points out that in some native languages, the term for plants translates to those that take care of us. So my particular project, I was thinking about language and marginalized people, and I'm living in Cape Town, I'm working at the University of Cape Town, um, and one of the archives that we hold is an archive called the Blake and Lloyd Archive. And in the 1870s, there were um, some San men and women who told their stories to two pioneering colonial scholars um, these two scholars, Blake and, and Lloyd, Lucy Lloyd, and these were meticulously taken down. Now, the stories about how they got to tell those stories is fairly traumatic. They were mainly um, people who were taken, or in a sense, rescued from the prison system in South Africa, which was a very, very, very heavy-handed colonial rule at the time. One of the main contributors was a man called Kaubo. Okay, Scum speaker is one of the main, uh, and he had this dream. And he had a dream where he wanted to tell the stories of his culture. And he'd heard about people who wrote stories down. And he was very conscious that his stories and his people were um, under siege and possibly imperiled. And his, his instinct here, his intuition here was right. But he managed to convey with Lucy Lloyd and William Blake um, a remarkable amount of the stories. And so um, this was my sense that maybe this was the language, the marginalized language, which needed to be a contributor to this particular project. Um, in discussion with Pippa Scottness, who curates the archive, um, she noted that the taxonomies are different, um, that you don't, that, that there are places where we would separate and they move things together, that a person is just another animal and baboons, for instance, are people. Um, one has identity, but not separation. And in this context, there's no word for landscape because there's no sense of separation from it, which in this context is, is, is very important. When I was invited to participate, I was staying in Namibia on a sabbatical and this call came out of the blue a bit. And I was um, a little bit discomforted by it because I thought I'm absolutely the wrong person to engage in this project. I'm an English first uh, language speaker, uh, one of the most dominating languages on the planet. Um, it has so much that is, is, is problematic in terms of colonial uh, heritage. And I, I almost said no. And then I thought, well, maybe it's a, a question of opening up conversation because this is in essence what the project is about. So I got hold of a, of a friend of mine, Sylvia Vollenhoven, who is a filmmaker, a, a renowned journalist, a playwright, a poet. And I said, well, this project has come up. Um, would you would you would you like to participate now sylvia uh, the, the critical reason here that i asked sylvia is that she wrote a book called the keepers of the Kum, and it's a it's a book that narrates her own journey she became very sick at one point in her life and western medicine had no uh, ability to 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 reach the problem and she ended up going to some sangomas um and one of which was a white sangoma and saying i i need help and the help that she received was a reconnection back to her ancestral voices in her ancestral dreaming. And that was held in the Blake and Lloyd archive, which she plumbed, which she became um, very strongly uh, engaged with. And in a sense, she was reconnected with her past and she regained her health through that process. So it's a very, it's a very powerful story, The Keeper of the Come. If you haven't read it, I really do suggest it. So it's a wonderful book. So um, I was, these are the, the collaborators that we ended up joining together. Uh, myself, uh, a photographer, Margaret Courtney Clark, um, a young graphic designer, uh, Ilunga, and uh, the voiceover artist Bradley von Sitters and Hilton Schneider's music. So was it, I mean, as in so often happens in these cases, you have many people who contribute to make this thing work. Um, I think maybe important to quickly put a little context on Namibia, which was also the home of, of many, um, well, in fact, seven micro nations of, of Bushmen. And I used that term not with uh, apostrophes, it is a reclaimed and preferred term in that region. I know it is historically complex, but in that region, it's a, it's a preferred term. And Namibia is an incredibly tough place. When I first landed there, um, I kind of felt my skin was seared. Uh, it's a very flat area. I landed on Volfus Bay. The desert stretches for miles. It's gritty, it's stony. You have extraordinary plants like the Wilwitchia in this image. And these plants are over a thousand years old. They find they've got the most extraordinary resilience. And the, the whole landscape keeps hitting one in the gut with difference and, and 
uh, it's it's a harsh and hard place to live and creatures and people and and plants take on different shapes in order to cope with the environment. It's also a very wondrous environment and there are also all sorts of uh, magic moments that one encounters. The image on the top right is a, is a, uh, a, it's a, it's a weaver's nest. It's a colony of weavers, sociable weavers they're called. They all live together in the same nest. Um, and sometimes the most extraordinary things happen after a seven year drought, some rock pools filled up. There'd been nothing there for seven years and suddenly these water lilies appeared. In Namibia, there are plants that are called resurrection plants because they can withstand dehydration up to 96%, um, completely and utterly adapting to the desert terrain. It's a wondrous place with many storms and many different things. I was staying with Margaret Courtney Clark and she gave me a studio to work in for, for six months. Um, she was probably the best guide I could possibly have for Namibia. And so I was uh, quite aware of my alienness and my um, out of, I'd never been there. Um, I was out of my um, milieu, if you like, and finding my way. And in, when I spoke to Sylvia, I, I, I took her around virtually around my, uh, my, my board in my studio. Some of the things that I'd been making to respond to this landscape that I was in and so I could have a conversation with her about what I was doing. This was the beginning of the painting you saw earlier. That's the studio I was working in. And I had become fascinated with this gritty and, and rocky environment. A couple of days later, she sent me a Bushman dictionary image. Um, Dorothea Blake, who is part of the team, part of the crew who were doing all this collecting of words. And she isolated a certain word within that. I'll show you an easier way of reading it. How to shoot a magical arrow or go on a magical expedition. I'd spoken to her about the environmental concerns of the, of the project. And it was an interesting word to get, to shoot a magical arrow or go on a magical expedition. And I saw it within the context of um, the Bushman lives that I had been made privy to through the photographs of, of Margaret Courtney Clark. And I also saw it in relation to the journeyings in the landscape that uh, I had been doing, which were sometimes excruciatingly hard. Um, we once traveled 60 kilometers and we only got out of second gear once. Um, and that took us eight hours. So it's, it's a tough land. The making of how this conversation is there is then all this presentation is not just about the making of the video itself, which we which we produced at the end of the conversation, but also about all the things that tend to feed into an artistic practice, the serendipitous encounters, the synchronicities and the kind of things that perhaps make one's skin tingle in relation to what one's finding out. After speaking to Sylvia. I went on a journey to Twiffelfontein, which is um, uh, uh, a place where there is a very uncertain spring. People have tried to uh, farm there and not succeeded because the, the, the waters are not always available. They're so erratic, you can't rely on them at all. It's a World Heritage Site. It has over two and a half thousand uh, rock engravings as quite the most extraordinary place. Everywhere you look, there are drawings of giraffe and rhino and lion and all sorts of things. It must have been animal full in those days. Um, I went there, as I say, at the end of a seven year drought and there was virtually not a, a standing creature. The image on the right was rather interesting. Our guide pointed it out and said this was a kind of blackboard. It was to teach kids uh, about the dangers of the area, about how to follow spores, to compare their own footprints to the spores of, of other animals, um, and was a kind of training, training ground. This was a map of the area. The image on the right has, you might see it's upside down, but that's a lion. And that indicates that that part of the valley is a dangerous place to go. Um, there are lions there. Having got this word in my head, I wondered what I could do with it. And I thought, well, maybe since I've seemed to have come back to the heart of a peoples that are now no longer with us, perhaps I should gift it back to the soil. I was terribly conscious that I was a white person. Um, I was a colonialist, um, but I felt that it maybe might be an appropriate uh, moment of exchange and return. So I did, I wrote it with my finger in the sand and I took the photograph and I left the imprint of other people's feet because this is about the layers of history and those of us who've disturbed the soil and the people who've disturbed the soil, our spur are different from the ones 
on the rocks. Namibia itself, as I say, is a really lean place. Um, a view like this is across the lichen fields near Swakopmund. And um, if you drive on this ground here, any, any mark that you make will, will stay for many, many tens of years. There's in fact an injunction in Namibia that you're not meant to go off the, the, the beaten track, but everybody does. And the landscape is very unsettled. In this particular area, you're not meant to go off road because of the lichen. It looks like a gray landscape, but is a remarkably rich one. There's a lichen board telling you about the lichen fields. It's so battered by sun and salt and wind, not rain, because there is no rain here. Um, and I took a photograph of it because of it, it signaled the lichen fields, but also because the surface of the uh, um, board had become a bit like the landscape it was in. It was almost like the landscape was destroying it, responding to it, engulfing it. And there was a, a little play here on the language of, of symbiosis and becoming that I thought was, 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 was interesting and fun. And I remembered that the National Geographic once described symbiosis as the art of living together. A little kind of encounter. This is what you find if you look at the rocks and you bear and you bother to spend a little bit of time not just driving past at a speed. This is the lichen, this is what it looks like on the rocks. It's an incredibly intense color, but if you look across the landscape, you don't see it. In that landscape, if you look at the ground, you can also pick up little bits of quartz. Yeah. And these little bits of quartz also have lichen on them. And one of the things that uh, struck me when I look at this, looked at this and marveled at these, this array, this fan of, of color, was that the shapes that were here, and I'm not sure if you can see my cursor, mirrored the shapes that were on my hand. That there was a kind of affinity with body and plant and rock that I would probably never have noticed before. And that the thing that looked so bleak was in fact so rich. Another place was fanning red at the same time. I had to return to Cape Town because I had an issue with an eye that couldn't see. I was going blind in one eye. And I had to go and have um, an injection in my eye, one of the most uh, psychologically disturbing experiences of my life. And I go back to Cape Town and the mountain caught fire. The mountain was burning. It looked, I mean, the mountain often burns. I live in a place, Table Mountain is one of the most famous mountains uh, in the world. It's certainly one of the most photographed. It's very picturesque and it does burn. It has to burn sometimes to help the, um, the plants, the, the flora uh, grow. Um, and it's, it, the Fang Boss reiterates itself through fire. But in this particular case, the fire spread and became very impactful on the university. These are photographs that I took at the time, the helicopters going over with the water that they were dumping on the fire, um, but the university did in fact catch fire. And one of the most um, precious buildings, you can see a tree get caught fire, things were exploding all over the place. Um, and the Yaga room, the Yaga reading room caught fire. Now this particular room held the African archive, the African studies archive, and this is a, a unique collection, exists nowhere else in the world. This is the place that people are going to, or were going to, to find out the records that people perhaps had not paid attention to in the past. And this particular moment, I come from a university where in 2016, the student protests were, were very, very strong and very, um, uh, the situation there, the changes, the demand for change and transformation was particularly voiced. This particular archive was the, was, the, was, the, was, was the heart of the sharing of knowledge. And it went up in flame. This is an image of the library inside after when well, the fire was still burning, but had died down so that people could go close enough to, to photograph it. Mm -hmm. My painting in Namibia began to feel a little prescient. The library itself, largely burnt. There were some uh, holdings that survived. Um, but immediately after the burning or with the fire and we were still not allowed in the building, it was feared that the Blake and Lloyd archive might have been lost. Um, all sorts of stories are going around as to, to where it was and how it was protected and so on. It was behind some fire doors and the fire doors apparently held. Um, unfortunately, the whole building was doused in water and the collections in the basement that were protected by the fire doors 
um, became sodden with water. And the rescue aspect of that was a, a, a very moving and very dramatic and very emotional thing. Much had been lost, but the majority of the Blake and Lloyd archive was in fact saved. And I'm, I'm just going to end this talk of, of kind of uh, synchronicity and um, conversations across objects, place, time, people with this uh, posting by Pippa Scottness. She posted this on Facebook. Um, you can see it's a casual photograph. She, she took, took a photograph and you can see her shadow is still cast over it. And the image in the photograph and the text, she writes, on top of the pile of rescue drawings in the Blake and Lloyd collection is one by a boy from the northern border of Namibia. It was made on the 18th of April, 1880. It shows the sticks used to make fire. 1880, the 18th of April, was 141 days, uh, years to the day when this fire occurred. And that seems to be an extraordinary confluence of events that it was the top drawing. It was the drawing about making fire in the most rudimentary ways. And so these are the kinds of things that went into the thinking about the video when we made it. And I will play it and I hope you can see it. It's four minutes long and I hope that's, uh, that you'll be able to receive it. Hold on, why are we not getting anywhere? My people had a word, no, more than a word. Kyle flowed through us, lived in us, connected us. Then it left us. When it went away, this word that is more than a word, it tumbled down the mountains and out of our mouths. A precious possession, stolen, gone. Nothing has come to fill the vacant house of the cow. Magic does not live in the home of the new words. Disconnected, broken arrows going nowhere. In the modern Khoi Khoi language, in Kokugova, we say no naris, and that means a divine journey. But deep in the earth, there is a healing. The land awaits our right doing. Ancestral voices guide us back to other magical arrows and the melody of words that are more than words to the cow 
of now. Thank you very much, Virginia, for sharing that, uh, that experience with us. And thank you for gifting us a new world. I'm sure we're always uh, all going to incorporate into, into our everyday magical thinking, going on a magical journey. Um, so um, I, I'm aware that it's a different time zone for you and uh, you are busy, but um, we need to move on as if, if you would like to stay with us if you can stay with us for the conversations afterwards. Um, 